Cause you love to have them all crying mm-hmm. Gonna be sweet day Tell me you need me But I'm from a city that's high school I give them the cinema I go uh, Cause you a bad man If she don't love money If she break ass real fast like come on When I swim down to the deep end Wanna know all my secrets Honestly Can you keep it real Cause honestly I can tell that you real fond of me Baby don't be shy I can see it in your eyes I've been running around Too bad I've been sticking out your mind I know you like it How I rock it from behind I know you stand it How you take it all my time Left, right, can you take it all the time Too bad I've been sticking out your mind I know you like it How I rock it from behind I know you stand it How you take it all my time Left, right, can you take it all night Take it Baby, with me, I ain't scared to take it Oh, and maybe when I take it all I feel it coming down too strong to resist cause I need ya And it's hard to be here cause I believe ya Call me tight mm. Hold it on tonight Hold them a cup of I'm gonna get to your clean and proper The way I move ain't no weekend lover You won't let me on your mind forever
say your say your middle name again. Shonday. 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 Hello, hello, hello. My name is Jerry Johnson. I am an actor, poet, and activist. Welcome to Voices, where we are celebrating the history, impact, and future of all women in our community and beyond. Voices is an event series Amazon Studio uses to connect directly with talent, customers, and the community to champion and explore all things diversity, equity, and inclusion in the entertainment industry. Today, in the spirit of true sisterhood, I am joined by my co-star and one of the most talented women I know, Shaniqua Shande. Together with an incredible ensemble of talent, we are a part of an all-female-led cast of Prime Video series, Harlem. Shaniqua will be my co-host this afternoon as we champion the women transforming the entertainment landscape. Shaniqua, thank you so much for being here with me. Thank you, you know I have a question for you. What does Women's History Month mean to you? Mm. Women's History Month means that for 11 months of the year, we are ignoring over half of the population. You got that right. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yes. Do we need a month? I understand. <laughs> and what about you, Jerry? What does Women's History Month mean to you? Women's History Month is a time for us to acknowledge truly just how much of a contribution women are to our society, to our community, but also that women are the start. We are creation. Our bodies create. And so there's nothing, nothing without a woman. Come on. Whenever Women's History Month or another Heritage Month arrives, it always begs the question, why don't we celebrate these communities year round? Yes. I know I do. And Prime Video is working to do this as well. And I can testament to this because everybody they hire at Prime Video is diverse. <laughs> but there is truly something special about a moment in time in each year that we can mm -hmm. pause and hyper amplify what black, indigenous, LGBTQ+, AAPI women and others are building. Yes. Oftentimes our voices go unheard and our work overlooked. So the importance of acknowledgement and utilizing platforms like this to create conversation about how we show up in different spaces remains vital to the future of this industry. Yes, and as a black queer woman in both real life and in my role as Ty on Harlem, I check a lot of boxes in historically excluded and underrepresented groups. I know all too well how essential it is to utilize your platform and show up as your authentic self. I know that a character like Ty was breaking the mold in media representation, and it would be an opportunity for me to be who I wanted to see growing up. And that is what this program is all about, y'all. Shattering glass ceilings, yes. no longer asking to be at tables we weren't invited to, but making our own and being the women that the next generation need to see. At this very moment in time, a black woman, Katonji Brown Jackson, who was nominated by the President of the United States to the U.S. Supreme Court, is going through Senate confirmation hearings. Yes, Mexican architect Frida Escobedo was named the first woman to design a wing at the prestigious Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. That museum first opened its doors in the late 1800s. So let that settle in. Leah Jackson became the first transgender woman to win an NCAA swimming title. Mm. Deb Holland was named Secretary of Interior, becoming the first indigenous cabinet secretary to serve a U.S. president in our nation's history. And Beyonce, my girl, <laughs> Talk about Beyonce. was the first black woman to open at Coachella in 2018. What are we doing, guys? Yes, and today, we get to witness even more history yeah. in the making with an exclusive clip of Lizzo promo promoting her new Prime Video competition series, Watch Out for the Big Girls, hey. <laughs> at South by Southwest. In her first look deal with Amazon Studios, this is her first role as an executive producer and star of her own TV show. This series follows Lizzo on her journey to discovering confident, 
badass women to join her backup dancer squad, the big girls for her upcoming world tour. You know that I am tuning in. Okay, <laughs> wait a minute, I just gotta give a moment to applaud a black woman who is a musician <laughs> and also an EP. Yes. Okay, I will be tuning in. Lizzo is one of the generation's pioneers in the body positivity movement. She makes me feel proud yeah. and I look forward to seeing this show unfold. Yeah. I know it will be revolutionary for viewers and serve as encouragement and inspiration to so many young people. My young black Shaniqua Shonda from Richmond, Virginia is screaming because I wanted to dance so bad. I wanted to do splits, but I was concerned about how my thighs would look in the dance uniform. So. It's okay, but we got We you. got her. She and got Lizzo me. has you. <laughs> I love that so much. <laughs> <laughs> and congratulations to her. Make sure you stay tuned for the clip and the watch show premiere today only on Prime Video. Before we get into today's programming, we should be doing this month, we would be doing this month a disservice without acknowledging Equal Pay Day, which recently passed on March 15th. Recently. Did you know that this date is different every year? and symbolizes how far into the year women must work to earn what men earned in the previous year. I think that should be January 1st. Yes. Mm -hmm. That means that we work on extra, we, that means, that, excuse me, that means women work an extra 74 days into 2022 to catch up to what men made in 2021. Listen, we've come so far, but we have a long way to go. Yes. And it's programs like Voices that will help us further the conversation and keep this dialogue at the forefront of all industries. Now let's get this show started. First up, we have insider senior entertainment business reporter, Elaine Lowe, moderating a conversation with women who are working hard behind the scenes to create platforms and networks to improve representation in front of the camera. We'll hear from television executive and founder of Who You Know, Bring Frank, executive director of Free the Work, Pamala Kim, and producer and co-founder of Groovy, Jeanette Volturno. This is going to be so good. Elaine, over to you. Thanks for that introduction. It's great to be here for Voices, Women Innovating Hollywood. I'm Elaine Lowe, senior entertainment reporter at Insider, and I'm joined today by an illustrious panel of women who are a major part of evolving the narrative around inclusion and increasing visibility for historically underrepresented groups in the entertainment industry. Please welcome Bree Frank, president and founder of Hue You Know and senior VP of physical production of Unscripted at Hello Sunshine, Jeanette Volturno, co-founder and COO of Cruvy and Pamala Music Kim, Executive Director of Free the Work. Thank you all for taking the time today. Thank you hey. so much for having us. Yeah. All right, so let's jump right in. Um, now, I know you all come from entertainment production backgrounds and have built these wonderful platforms to address underrepresentation. So I was wondering if you, know, you all could tell me real quick a little bit about the trajectory of your careers um, and you know, what brought you to, to entertainment. Who, who would love to kick us off? I'll, I'll start. <laughs> All right, Brie. <laughs> uh, so I started many, many years ago um, doing product placement for independent films, worked in casting for a little bit, tried to find my way into scripted. It was very difficult to navigate an industry that was um, had a lot of barriers and no transparency on how to get your way in. And so I volunteered after I left advertising to intern for a production company that took me on. I acquired uh, a certain level of skills and then I'm um, starting to make my way into the freelance world until I landed a staff position at Matador Content, which touched upon different genres of production, which I had never really experienced before. And then uh, over two years ago, joined Hello Sunshine to help build out their physical production company and was actually able to um, touch upon many of the different uh, temp poles that they have to establish. So was able to build a really strong skill set in the last three years. Very cool. And I know Hello Sunshine has so many really incredible projects in the work. So, you know, interested to hear more about your experience soon. Um, you know, what about you, Pamala? How, uh, how about you? Uh, tell us a little bit about your career. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I actually started on the advertising side. So I was a commercial agent for talent. And so I spent about 15, 17 years doing that. Um, I was really fortunate to work with a lot of great folks. I act, it's actually a business I didn't even know really existed. And I grew up in the Valley. Um, so it says a lot to, doesn't matter the proximity, if you're not exposed to certain things, you just don't know about them. Mm -hmm. Um, I was very, somebody recommended me for a job. Um, I was fortunate enough to get it. I started that trajectory. I learned a lot. I was, you know, everything from an executive producer assistant to all the way into being a commercial rep on that front. Then after about 17 years, I got really, really tired of earning some folks a lot of money and they probably wouldn't recognize me on the street if I had walked by them um, and really just felt like I needed to feed my soul a little bit more and kind of noticed where I was also wanting to kind of make a little bit more impact. So I left, um, we closed uh, our agency and actually I went into tech, spent three, four years, was very fortunate working with um, creative marketplaces where Basically, it's like a database community on steroids, but it's for the creative side of the business. Started working that, started to become really specialized in marketplaces, worked with like female photographers, all these different ones, and then landed at um, Free the Work in the end of 2019 and have just been really learning all of the ins and outs of nonprofit land and then also adding the film and TV side to it as well. Oh, fascinating. And since you just joined in 2019, I'll be interested to hear what your mostly pandemic work experience has been yeah. like. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> what about you, Jeanette? Well, I started off um, as a PA and I, I ended up getting pulled into the accounting department, which was fantastic and not something that I expected. But I, I had mentioned to somebody that I wanted to learn what a producer does and become a producer. And they said, you need to be in accounting. And, and that was a not something that I had expected. And from there, I had mentioned to another friend that I really wanted to find out how a major motion picture studio worked. So she took me to lunch at Sony and I met some of the people there and ended up getting a job offer for um, a visual effects coordinator at Sony Imageworks back in the day. And then that took me over to Europe to help build a, a studio over there. And I, I loved the the way the Europeans really revere directors and it's about the director. And when I came back to Los Angeles, I knew I wanted to be on the production side of things. So I, I started uh, Catchlight back then. And um, a few years later, I, I got a, a call from DreamWorks and it was this little film called Paranormal Activity. And they asked us to do some reshoots on it and uh, to help you know get it to where it was where, theatrically. And that was really fun. And I met um, you know Jason Blum from that and, and just kept, moving forward, producing projects, and then creating and building a production for that uh, company. And 13 years later, left it a couple of years ago uh, and created, brought, brought Catchlight back with some friends and, and really realized while I was running production over there that there was um, a need to find and, and balance crews and, and how do you find them when you're traveling and working and um, one central location and a, and a platform, a place for people to be able to identify how they want to identify and express how they want to express and uh, to find their pathway forward. So that's that's what caused me to build Kruvi with my partners and finding some amazing coding women who who helped us build that dream. Mm, that's interesting. And, and you know, the thing that all three of you obviously have in common is how your platforms work to to sort of overcome the, the historical underrepresentation in the industry. And I'm so interested to hear, was there you know, how did you all get to this very point? Was there sort of one impetus or, or, you know, sort of a series of inequities that you've observed along the way? You know, tell me what brought you to this very moment. I know for me, um, there have been little small deposits of frustration that eventually led to that night where I couldn't sleep at night and it, it turned out to be the first day of Black history where I decided to create a Facebook group, group which became Hue. Um, of just 27 people that I can identify that were people of color from all of the people that I had gained, who had been in, working in the industry for, for 17 years. And um, my initial thought was like, someone should create a safe space for people of color so they can ask the questions that they are afraid to ask and figure out what it takes to like get a job in the industry. And then um, a little voice came to me and said, why not me? And from that night of insomnia, built a company that's a nonprofit that's now five years old and has over 18,000 members. I think that um, what I recognize as someone who's tried to navigate my way through the industry with no context 
um, is it's really important to network, but it's also really important to leverage the power that you have in this industry to bring about change. And so I'm really an advocate of everyone and teaching everyone and recognizing myself to be a student of my power and to figure out what it does in the room and figure out how it can help other people besides myself. And so that pure intention that helped me build Hue is the thing that has driven so many powerful conversations in this industry. Yeah, I think it also comes a lot from lived experience. Uh, you know, Alma Harrell is our founder. She started it in 2016. Um, it was basically, you know, she was trying to understand why female directors in advertising were not making it. Um, mm -hmm. Every time she would triple bid on a job, she was always the only female director. And even getting to that point was incredibly difficult. So she implemented a very simple pledge that for every triple bid in advertising, there'd be one female identifying director. And it got backlash and she was, you know, told that she would never work again and all of these different things. And it actually worked out really well. And right after that became the flashpoint for Me Too. Obviously, the, you know, Me Too movement's been around for a long time, but that's happened to be when it got media attention. And so a lot of people all of a sudden were realizing kind of these different data sets and kind of what could they do. And that was like a really simple premise. And it came, became the pillars for what eventually um, turned over into 2019 for free the work because we then expanded to all underrepresented creators beyond advertising and beyond just directors. But that pledge, that kind of getting into and understanding the hiring pro the process and why do people go to the same well? Why do people have these same habits? And going in and just making those small changes to kind of change what happens over time and grow it. And I think for me being on the representation side for talent, I was having the same experience. Like why is my underrepresented talent not making it through? Why is it so much harder for them? Why do they keep going back to the same people when they know they're gonna get the same exact creative output? So I think, again, it's just like the lived experience of saying, okay, somebody has to jump in. And I think that's gotta be me. Mm, interesting. And, and what about you, Jeanette? Uh, for Marcy and I, my business partner, Marcy Brown and I, um, you know, being physical producers and coming up that road, we, we're constantly being asked to fill out forms of, you know, how many people, uh, how many women did you have? How many people of color did you have, you know, in different, in different areas. And we realized that not, not only could we not find people, we couldn't believe that there wasn't a tool that was already out there that was global, that had all of these um, capabilities of union, non-union, you know, how you identify um, if you have a car, like all the questions that we would ask is hiring producers. So we knew that if we needed the tool that other people needed the tool, and it was something that we literally built for ourselves. And, you know, uh, being women who are constantly trying to pull people up into the industry and, and shift people into different positions, it was a way that we could track where people had started, where they were going and provide the analytics of, of how you're hiring and, and have the transparency of the people that you've interviewed for the project and all the way through to the end to see how you've actually staffed the show. Mm. And, and Jeanette, tell me a little bit more about the development of, of Kruvi and, and how you sort of parse through the analytics of that, of you know the intention and need and, and the audience that you're, you're working for. Yeah, I mean, we, we're, it's a global audience, it's a global platform and it's for everyone. So if you're a beginner and you're coming in, you can write aspiring so that we can track the department and the trajectory of where you wanna go. The last thing you wanna do is hire somebody who wants to be an editorial and you place them in the costume department, right? So it gives them a voice to be able to say, this is where I wanna go. They can choose to self-identify in 30-ish different categories that we have on the site. Um, and because we built it and um, our, our business partners, Camille and Sandra, who are amazing tech wizards, um, they can change things and create all of the zany dreams in our heads of how we wanna build something and, uh, and, and make that happen. So for us, it was a chance to be able to capture data, um, present it back without passing lists around without having, you know, there's a lot of our industry passes lists and it exposes people's information and they don't even know that they're on the lists. And here in Kruvi, you know, they can choose what they want to have public and not public and still be part of the analytics. And it's, it's so important to represent because that's where people can see the change. They can follow where they're at and see wh where they're going and, and how to get there. 
Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned these lists, and I, I wonder if um, Pamala and Bree, you know, you've had sort of this, a similar experience. And I think in a lot of creative industries, there are, you know, these whisper networks that build up of sort of like the folks you want to work with, and the, sometimes the folks you don't. You know, um, you know, Pamala uh, and, and Bree, you know, I'm curious too from your side, what has that experience been like of sort of, you know, codifying like these are the networks, and and here's how we can really turn it into a, a serviceable platform. I know for me that I've seen those lists, I've been on those lists <laughs> for as long as I can remember. I've seen them, I've had to create them when you're looking for like who are some great line producers, directors, producers. And when we created Hue five years ago and we had our own list, we were trying to use the list for good. What it became was so untenable to try to figure out who was available and who was not. And that's when I was able to lean into the folks that staffed me up who already had a built out database to try to figure out if they could optimize it for DEI. And so I think that those lists, it depends on whose hands it in, right? Like whose intention um, are you up against and who is defining you as qualified versus not qualified, who is interested in being culturally additive versus like not culturally additive. And I think that, um, you know, it's really important to the work that Free the Work is doing and Kruvi is doing and Coda for Inclusion with Staff Me Up, like all of it is like really important, but it has to be optimized for good with the good intentions because the databases can only go as far as like the permission that exists within our, in Hollywood, mm -hmm. um, which is problematic in itself, but a large part of it is like who is utilizing the database for the right reasons to truly change the scope of who's being hired versus who's not. I hope I answered your question, but yeah, yeah. yeah, I think it's just, it becomes very transactional in a lot of ways. I think those lists are transactional. And so when you start turning people into transactions, it's just, it's very short-sighted, but it's also, you're working against budgets. You're working against timelines. You're getting cornered. And what's happening is we see is that like, you know, a lot of studios or a lot of executives and a lot of people want to make the change, but how is it trickling down to the person who's actually doing the hiring? So a lot of the people who are creating these lists or needing these lists, how are they getting, they're hearing the message, but how are they using the tools? Are they seeing the tools? And then I think there's just a little bit of just like overwhelm, you know, some over feelings of overwhelmness and like, well, I'm just going to go back to my list because I know who's on that list. And so there's this whole idea that underrepresented creates some kind of risk or some like you're either under experienced or you're under budget or you're risky. And so it's really also trying to look at these other elements as well and say, how do we uplift this talent so that and get them into their getting their names into the market and getting their names into production enough to where we're not the only person saying their name the crew member saying their member or the production designers also saying their name because that's really how these things kind of work so it's like those are lists you know lists and databases and platforms can be here all day and all night but like it's also about all the other parts of what we're doing too to add value and also showcase these folks that have amazing talents. Yeah, you need to address the system, right? Yeah. So like you can create as many laws as you want. The mm -hmm. citizens have to uphold it. The people who are in charge of upholding the laws like have to be able to, it has to be like legislated. Like you have to be able to operationalize it. And so the way that I think about it is just like, you can't manage what, don't, what you can't, you can't manage what you don't measure and you can't, and you don't measure what's never been valued. Right. Mm -hmm. And so even when you create these databases and all these access points for people to try to enter the industry, if you create a whole industry where everyone's metrics is still centered in heterosexuality, heteronormative activities, maleness, whiteness, then what good is a database? Who, why do you care who's available? If you don't, if you are thinking you're doing charity work, <laughs> if you are measuring the success of someone who's lacked opportunity for years against someone whose the door has always been open for, and also to not make it punitive for the person who's done the work for the last 20 years, like how do you create a holistic approach to changing the industry? Like there's so many different facets. I think that a lot of people think about it as like, it's a top down approach or they're like, it's bottom up, it's the interns. And I'm like, it's all that. And you know what it is? It's middle out. Like start looking at the people that already exist in your world and elevate them to like the next level and stop thinking about everything through the same structures in which we've always done things and expecting things to change. I think it's impossible to make yeah. change that way. 
Mm. Data, like I think the data that everyone's collecting on these platforms is incredibly important and it tells a story, but it's also like, what do you do with that data? But then it's also, how are you creating an environment and how are you supplementing culture? And how are we looking at the, like the, everything that Bree is saying and how are we building out from that? Because again, it's, it's, it's this constant fight of like, this is not a risk that you, you just haven't heard their name yet. And so who do you need to hear their name from, you know, to make it okay. And it's just this constant battle of like, it's so much more than just giving somebody numbers or just giving them the, the thing to do or the five things to be anti-racist. It's like, it's so much more of like, what happens in that moment when, if something does go down, um, what's happened, what's the culture on set? Why do people feel, feel fearful to even mention that they're queer? You know, it's all of these things that have been, we've set in place in production for so long that just need to be actually addressed and looked at and, and cared about. And, and there are so many different lenses through which we can sort of talk about underrepresentation and how those needs need to be met. Um, you know, can we talk about aging for a minute? And because I think that's something that in particular, when you're talking about women and those who are female identifying, it's it's there's a compound effect than when you're talking about very talented men who happen to be over 40, you know, like tell me a little bit about how that's played into um, you know, your experience and, and what you're seeing with the data and, and the talent that you're helping. I remember when I met with um, the folks that staffed me up when I when they were trying to figure out why someone like me wouldn't want to use the site and they were trying to figure out like how to get more people of color engaged to self ID and I was like oh black people notoriously won't put their picture anywhere near their profile because they don't want to be discriminated against. And I think the same thing happens with anyone who is othered like you are so afraid that you just can't get on the in the room on your merits alone that you are trying to disguise yourself and who you are in order to get inside the room. And I think that when we're doing it right, you're allowing that otherness to enter the room and it's being at the center of your priorities and not this addendum that you'll get to or a, like a nice to have. Mm. Yeah, I think we all like playing on both of what they're saying is like giving back to the community, but also recognizing that otherness. And I think with the the environment right now with politics and everything that's happening, it's created a really divisive environment, but also it's created this huge scarcity mindset amongst the majority as well. So now you've got two psychologies that you're trying to answer to and trying to meld together because the data and the work is not helpful if no, if like either side is not actually self-identifying. So we do onset self-identification and it's called invoke and so we ask a series of questions well beyond just demographics because we do feel that everybody has a story to be told and that is also including age so we have about a 95 percent participation rate on set um and that age question is actually a huge thing and it goes back to everything that Jeanette and Bree are saying hmm, interesting uh, and 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 you know let's also talk uh, about race for a moment too uh, I mean you know supposedly the industry underwent this, you know, this this quote unquote reckoning. It's uh, as as the press likes to call it. Myself guilty as much. And and I I wonder if have we really been sort of through any significant, um, you know, evolution of this conversation, um, you know, since the summer of 2020, in in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, when studios made all of these promises and pledged money and you know really vowed to. To, to sort of take hold of the problem as you know as, as it saw in the in entertainment industry. I mean, what's your your view on how the last two years have played out from that lens? I don't know. I mean, I've seen I've seen some meaningful change. I've also seen a lot of performative change. I think that um, for me, this the reckoning, which we all I say it as well because it's the thing that you identify. You know exactly what folks are talking about. Is really not so much as a reckoning, but um, a running from cancel culture. <laughs> people who are afraid that they won't win the woke Olympics. And so they kind of jump on this bandwagon and they try to do it. And then the moment you try to, try to get them to do the work and you understand it, like DEI work is not about me telling you about me. DEI work is about me telling you about you. <laughs> it's you looking inward and trying to figure out like, what is what is it that you're bringing to the table that's outside of work? Why do people think that like they can be at home and have this like very um, this world with like the same doctors not being invited into spaces that are othered, and then they come into work and they're going to hear we are the world 
like chiming in and then all this diversity and inclusion is going to exist but it doesn't exist anywhere outside the world and like really trying to get people to dial in who who do you empower outside of work and why then would you come to work and then see anything different right so you have all these conversations and people want to do it but then they don't want to acknowledge the supply and demand issue that exists in our industry comes from this uh exclude these exclusionary practices that happen for 30 or 40 years why aren't there enough senior people in physical production that are people of color why are the women still missing from very senior roles i think that personally before i can have a conversation with dei i need to point to you that your about us page is your constitution it is exactly who you are i know what you value as soon as i see your about us page and if you want to change that then you need to inherently change the systems that don't allow for other people who look different to be on that about us page and it doesn't need to be uh, punitive and you shouldn't feel shame, but you have to be deliberate about the work that you're doing in order for people to trust you to come inside your space. Like psychological safety is such a huge part of it that people just wanna see diversity, but they don't care about equity. They don't really care about inclusion. Not, not, they're not really investing into that. They want the physical representation of diversity without like doing the work. Without doing that structural institutional work. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's just a lot of more conversation needs to be happened, but it's beyond representation at this point. It is further into the belonging and inclusion portion. And what does that actually mean? And it's interesting to hear how many people even have different definitions of what equity means. And so we've been now in this DEI language space for two years, hot and heavy, but like people still don't actually know the definitions of these words that they're using. And I think that that also in itself is an issue. Yeah, we, we partner with several different groups. We're a pathway provider for um, one in four for people with uh, disabilities, with um, RNCI for Red Nation, um, you know, Hollywood CPR, a lot of the different programs that are helping people in underserved communities. And when we partner with them, we lean into hearing what it is that is important to them and where we can help them on the site with the tools that they need for their group and how people can find them and what makes them unique. So for us, it's really training and it's learning and it's listening and it's reflecting that back out to the community so that those tools are provided for the people that are looking for those skilled workers or people that are getting into the industry and, and bringing them up that way. And I'm curious, working with these major studios and production companies from you know, this question's for all three of you. From your experience, what are some structural and institutional changes that still need to be made? Um, you know, we see a lot of initiatives and a lot of programs, um, you know, sort of what, what will it take from here where we are in 2022? I know there's a professor, he does the diversity report for Hollywood, and he has an acronym called MEANS, and that is like the true path to create change in Hollywood. Everyone should go Google, look that up and see um, what it is. I wish I can't think this of this. Is the UCLA report? Yes. Dr. Darnell Hunt. Yes, thank yeah. you. His acronym means and like hiring more women of color and putting them in positions of power, like making sure that you have metrics, like 360 reviews, like all these different things that really hold people accountable. I think that true change in this industry is taking the people who you revere, who you love, and holding them accountable. I think that there's plenty of grace for getting it wrong, but not without lack of accountability. I think that we are in a very specific time in our world, but for the first time, probably in history, people who are marginalized and, and marginalized and others get to define who they are and how they want to be spoken to and how they want to be represented. And so, and for the first time, it's consequential if you don't get it right. And I think that when you're trying to do it, but still stay comfortable, then you are going to feel the wrath of what happens when you get it wrong, which mm -hmm. is an opportunity to learn and to grow. And so I think that the way that studios and networks can get it right is A, spend money. It's not charity. <laughs> you got to put some money down. You got to make sure you're investing into programs, supporting Free the Work and Crewy and Coded for Inclusion in a real meaningful way. Array Crew, who's done amazing work. Like there's so many different people doing the work. Believe them, give them the money to help you backfill some of the things that are like the empty gaps and deltas that exist in the industry. Mm. 
Yeah, I think we we kind of jump into like the corporate side of this and like in the sense of like everything that like Brie and Jeanette are saying and bring that to set because that's actually where the transactionalness is kind of coming from. So can we bring that to set? So when we do set identification on set, we are actually kind of also acting as a bridge and a pathway to kind of say, hey, what else is going on with you? Do you feel safe at work today? Do you feel like you have the tools to do what you need to do today? Hey, can everyone just wear a name tag? Because if somebody is new coming in and they don't know what's going on, they don't know who's who, can we make it slightly more accessible for people coming in or people who are new or even people who are maybe not your everyday extrovert. We have lots of people amongst us who are introverts. So like understanding different ways of different, I'm not saying we have to change the entire production pipeline. I'm just saying, can we add things to it that will give some of that grace and bring some of that culture and bring some of that care and consciousness into it. And then from there, we can take data and use it for good. We can be so specific with the planning if we have the data, but that means everybody has to opt in because then we can say, hey, very clearly, let's take these funds from this place and do that program that Jeanette and Brie are mentioning with those pathway organizations and saying, hey, these people are, you know, we know that all of these people on Kruby are aspiring to be X. Let's go get the money from the studio because we know that that's also missing because of the data and go get these people who want to do this job and upskill them. Mm -hmm. So I think there's just two two ways of bringing more care and consciousness to set and actually using the data for good, but we need everyone to opt in. Mm. Tell me about, about the big wins that you've had recently. Uh, we were on set recently and we had um, a director cry because they got to choose Jewish. Mm. Um, well, let's see. Um, I'm on Project Greenlight and we have a female director, first time ever. <laughs> um, Hugh did a beautiful um, partnership with Nat Geo for a year, and we were able to get seven BIPOC companies development deals with National Geographic, and we're working on an equity provision to really focus on getting revenue recognized by these BIPOC production companies so they can build infrastructure, and I'm very proud of it. Yeah, great. Wow, this is great. I, I, I love being able to end on a positive note. And I want to thank you all so much for your time. This has been a really enlightening conversation, and I hope it's a conversation that folks will be able to keep going uh, off the screen and off of this panel. Um, but thank you all again, uh, you know, Pavala, Bree, and Jeanette. And thank you, everyone else at home, for joining this conversation. Bye. Thanks, Elaine, so much. Thank Ladies, you. you're awesome. Pamala, I have to find you on LinkedIn. I, we, we need to oh, connect. Yeah. And Jeanette, <laughs> yes. I'm so happy to finally meet you. I know, I right? Thank you so much. So, and I, <laughs> I, I love what you're doing with Kruvi. So I definitely would love to thank chat you. with you also. Drinks all um, around. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Seriously. So Good. Bye, y'all. Bye, everyone. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye, guys. Thank you, Elaine, and thank you to our panelists, Bree, Pamala, and Jeanette for bringing to light true representation. Mm. Each of you have broken the traditional Hollywood mold to create a new system that empowers all ages, races, genders of color. What courage it took for Brie to boldly enter into these spaces and sit at the table without a proper roadmap. Bravery allowed her to discover one of her purposes and create Hue as a safe space for those in the industry that look like her. And it's truly inspirational. What resonated with you, Shaniqua? Um, each of these women bring something so vital to this industry and remind us all how important it is for all of us to utilize the positions we have and the power that we wield from within to implement change. Yes. I was taking no honey. And here are a few quotes that stood out to me. It's important to network. Listen, I don't want to go nowhere, <laughs> <laughs> but it's an important, it's so important to network yes, yes, yes. and it's important to leverage the power you have in this industry to bring about change how you can help other people besides yourself. Thank you, Brie. It's beyond representation. It's about furthering belonging and mm -hmm. inclusion and inclusion. And what does that actually mean from Pamala? Yes, true change in this industry is taking the people who you revere, yes. who you love, and holding them accountable. That's, Brie, that was a point right there. That's important. And it, those are such 
great key points to implement change. And with these women helping to ensure that they are reflected in the industry, we are definitely off to a great start because you know we need the help. Absolutely. (laughs) And we are so far off to this start. I feel so confident in what's coming up. We have the USC Annenberg Inclusion Initiative, the leading global think tank studying diversity and inclusion in all forms of entertainment. They'll be reviewing data they've gathered for their study titled Inclusion in the Director's Chair that debunks the idea that women and people of color directors are less successful and where they currently stand within the industry. And I have to say that as a supporter of a female director, Megan Good, who just finished my music video, I cannot wait to hear what this is about. Oh, yes, yes. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, We're here representing the Annenberg Inclusion Initiative, which is the leading global think tank studying diversity and inclusion in all forms of entertainment. Today, we're here to talk to you about a research report we recently released, which is an annual study called Inclusion in the Director's Chair. We use this study to track hiring practices surrounding women and people of color behind the camera in top grossing films. Each year, we look at the 100 top grossing movies to understand uh, how often women and people of color are hired for these films. Uh, And we've looked from 2007 to 2019. And in this most recent study, we expanded to include 2020 and 2021. As you can imagine, these years were a bit anomalous for theatrical releases. And so in order to construct a sample that matches the films that we had in our previous work, uh, this year we looked at 37 films in 2020 and 51 in 2021 based on market share. Uh, We also look at the distributor slates of major and mini major companies who are releasing films. We look at streaming platforms to understand if there's access and opportunity for directors uh, on those platforms. And lastly, we look at top awards to understand the recognition that women and people of color are getting for their work throughout the industry. We have three units of analysis in this study. We look at directors, we look at films, and we look at nominations. And across everything, we're interested in gender, race, ethnicity, and Metacritic scores, which Alba will talk to you about later. And so diving in, uh, over time, across 15 years and 1,388 top grossing films, more than 1,500 directors, we see that women make up 5.4% of directors overall. What's encouraging about this chart is that we see that from 2019, uh, the gains that we saw that year have persisted throughout 2020 and 2021. So we are seeing women holding more positions as directors of top grossing movies in those years than we saw uh, in 2007 or in previous years. So this is encouraging, there's a sign of progress. Uh, This translates uh, to 66 individual women directors working across top grossing films from 2007 to 2021. These are their names. We always find it important to show uh, not just the numbers, but actually the names and identities of the women who are working behind the camera across top grossing movies to continue to dispel the myth that when people think director, they think male. I'll pass it over to Alba to talk to you about another finding uh, related to women directors from this study. Thanks, Kate. Um, So a common misconception that exists across the industry is that films helmed by women will be of lesser quality. And we wanted to address this because how films perform influences which directors are chosen for big budget projects. So to evaluate this, we took the average Metacritic scores of films directed by both men and women. And we took the average since it would account for outliers in the data. And what we saw was that films directed by men averaged 54.3 points, whereas for women directors, it was 56.6. What this data tells us is that women directors, in fact, create films that perform slightly better than their male counterparts and perform slightly better than what is expected of them in the industry. When we turn it to underrepresented directors, we saw that in 2021, there was the highest percent of underrepresented directors um, at 27.3% took the lead. Um, we saw that um, although this was a significant increase from 2020 and 2007, the percentage of underrepresented directors in 2021 is still well below the US census with 39.9% of the population identifying as a person of color. When we look at underrepresented directors overall, our data shows that directors of color made up only 14.8% of all directors over 15 years. When we're comparing this to their white counterparts, this gives us a ratio of 5.7 white directors to every one underrepresented director in the industry. 
Similar to how uh, we evaluated films by women directors and how they performed, we also assessed the quality of films helmed by underrepresented directors. Taking the average Metacritic scores of over 1,300 films, we saw that the critical reception between films created by white directors and underrepresented directors were roughly equivalent. Again, the idea that films made by underrepresented directors or women would be of lesser quality does not stand true, even though they are faced with fewer opportunities in the industry. And while it's important to look at gender and underrepresented status individually, we also find that it's critical to look at intersectional inclusion and particularly women of color. So when we look at the percentage of directors across 15 years who are women of color, we see that less than 2% of all of the directors across these 1,388 movies, more than 1,500 directors, less than 2% were women of color. This is 18 movies uh, in the span of time, and it's far, far below the 20.3% of the US population that's represented by women of color. And as you can see, it's far below the, the numbers for underrepresented men and white women, and drastically below the percentage of white men working as directors across top grossing movies. And although the gains made by women directors held since 2019, we cannot say the same for women of color. Of the 66 individual women directors from 2007 to 2021, only 15 were from underrepresented racial or ethnic groups. And 15 of these women of color directors directed only 18 films since 2007. So what this data tells us is that women of color directors are not present in the industry. In other words, there may be more people watching this presentation than the number of women of color directors that have directed a film in 15 years. And this is extremely odd because despite such low representation of women of color directors across the industry and in top grossing films, we see that women of color directors actually earn higher critical reception scores than their counterparts. Another way to think about the opportunities for women throughout the industry is to look at the slates of films released by uh, distributors over time. And so that's what we did. We looked at eight major and mini major companies. Every film that was released on their slates from 2015 to 2021, regardless of whether it was in our top grossing film sample, these are US uh, fictional English language films released between 2015 and 2021. And what you can see on the slide is that there are a couple top performers for women, Universal Pictures, STX, they're performing above the competition when it comes to the percentage of women directors on their slates. However, the biggest takeaway from this chart is that there still hasn't been one year since 2015 when every major or mini major distributor has released at least one movie with a woman director. So there's absolutely room for progress behind the camera for women directors at every major company. Again, when we turn to women of color, the story is even more upsetting. Uh, 34 out of the 56 film slates represented on that previous slide across eight companies and seven years 34 of those 56 film slates did not include even one underrepresented woman director. So as we think about progress at different companies, we have to think about the role that women of color play uh, in helming movies. And when we're considering how women are performing in top grossing films, um, a question that commonly comes up is, well, are there women directors in the pipeline? And the simple answer is yes, there are. We see that women directors earlier in the career where they're making more independent and narrative films actually entered the industry at, um, at a rate of 37.8%. And we got this data from the Sundance Dramatic Competition from 2015 to 2021. Usually what we see happen in the pipeline through the industry is that uh, directors usually go from narrative independent films to then episodic TV content. And when women are moving towards directing episodic content, we saw that from the data provided by the Directors Guild of America, that women directors made up 22.3% of TV directors from 2012 to 2021. From there, the pipeline usually leads directors to then directing top grossing films. And this is where we see the drastic decrease, where only 5.4% of women directed top grossing films since 2007. And we see a similar trajectory for underrepresented directors as well as women of color directors in the industry. From narrative films to top grossing films, we see a 32.4% drop in women directors, telling us that we are actually losing women as they ascend through the pipeline. If we took the inverse of this data, this would actually reflect how men directors move through their career trajectory. So in other words, the percent of men directors will actually increase as they make their way through the pipeline in the industry. 
Another place where we can start to think about access and opportunity for women and people of color behind the camera is across streaming platforms, which as we all know have gained even greater importance uh, as we've been watching at home throughout the pandemic. And so for this study, we looked across four streaming platforms uh, at original US content that was released on those platforms in 2020 and 2021. And for women directors, the story is clear. Every major streaming platform had a larger percentage of women directors than top grossing theatrically released movies. In the case of Amazon Prime, they actually had more than double the percentage of women directors working on their platform. When we turn to people of color, the story is again the same. Every platform outperforms top grossing films when it comes to having people of color working behind the camera as directors in their original content. Uh, lastly, when we think about women of color, we see that there's again a drop off in the percentage of women of color working as directors on these platforms, but that these, these groups still either come in at or in the case of Amazon Prime above the percentage of women of color directors of top grossing films in 2020 and 2021. And the main story here for these findings is that it can be done. It is possible to hire a larger share of women and people of color and women of color as directors of films. Uh, these streaming platforms point to just how we can have access and opportunity throughout the industry um, and that there is a place for these stories. They find audiences uh, and there's an opportunity for people to work. Uh, the streaming platforms are showing us just how easy it is to make this happen. I'll hand it back to Albab to talk about the last section of the study. And another way we measure the progress of women directors in the industry is through their award recognitions. And what we did was that we assessed the best director award nominations across four award organizations, the Golden Globes, Directors Guild of America Awards, Academy Awards, and Critics' Choice Awards since 2008. And what we saw is that from 2008 to 2022, only 8.9% of Best Director nominees went to women, whereas 91.1% went to men. Looking at this by organization, we saw that there was no significant difference across these shows. When we turn to underrepresented directors, we see a slightly better picture than women, but again, not great. And, all, and overall, 19.4% of Best Director nom nominees from 2008 to 2022 went to underrepresented directors across the four award shows. When we broke this down by award show, we saw, we saw that there was no notable difference across the organizations, which tells us that, th that this practice is a standard across the industry. Yet when we look at women of color, we see an even more devastating truth. And across 325 total award nominations for Best Director over 15 years, only three women of color have been nominated for a Top Director Award across four award organizations, two of which were nominated in 2021. What this award data tells us is that women and women of color are not fairly recognized for their efforts. And although directors of color represent 19.4% of all award nominations since 2008, they are still falling behind their white counterparts. Now I will pass it back to Kate to wrap up the key findings. Thanks, Alpha. So despite the overwhelming amount of data that we've just shared with you, there are a few major takeaways. First, we've seen progress in top grossing movies for women and people of color behind the camera as directors. Where we haven't seen progress is for women of color uh, who still represent less than 2% of all directors of top grossing films uh, across, more than, across 15 years and more than 1,300 movies. We see that companies continue uh, to need to improve their slates. Uh, we need a year where at least uh, every studio hires at least one woman director. Uh, and when we look to streaming platforms and to the pipeline, we see that there are places where there's access and opportunity for women and people of color working as directors. And that these can serve as models for how to think about top grossing films. Lastly, when we look to awards, we see that industry recognition for the talent, expertise, and, and exquisite work of women and people of color is continually overlooked across some of the major stages globally. What can be done? Uh, there's a couple of, of different solutions that we offer in the report, but really it's about uncoupling identity from, from the idea of what people can do. So when people think about directors, they can't just think male, they have to think about women, they have to think about people of color, and they have to be able to 
to separate the identity of the lead character, which oft, often drives opportunities uh, that directors are given to really expand the ways in which we conceive of who can direct what types of films. There are ways to improve these numbers as we look to different parts of the industry, we see how that's happening. Uh, and we look forward to continuing to chart a progress for women, people of color, and in particular, women of color in the years to come. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, ladies, for sharing such a detailed analysis, excuse me, analysis. Your roles are so mm -hmm. important as we seek to dismantle myths and barriers of exclusion in Hollywood. Yes. It's encouraging to see the progress along with the names of the women who are helping transform the director's chair. But the numbers don't lie. And at and as Megan said earlier, we have a long way to go. Yes. I'll be glad when award shows truly recognize our con contributions to this industry and give us our flowers. All of the flowers. All of a them. Okay, so we can wear them. Okay, <laughs> and until then, we'll continue to create and pave the way for the next generation. Facts, yeah. facts. These numbers are telling two stories. Mm -hmm. One is the growing appetite for film directors by, by women and especially women of color. The other story is the lack of true representation, the higher up the ladder you go. I mean, through these statistics, they, they show a rise in women directors in general. We also saw a dip in directors who are women of color, representing less than 2% of all directors for top grossing films. This accounts for the last 15 years and more than 1,300 movies. As these ladies said, Hollywood's image of women director is white. And we have to change that, period. Period. These numbers are certainly a reminder that women like Brie, Pamala, and Jeanette from our Innovating Below the Line panel are vital mm -hmm. to this industry. We have to shift the conversation around belonging and inclusion early and create a pipeline for talent to feel more welcome into this space. Yes. Because when you are more welcome, you can create more. Mm -hmm. It has to be a priority and not just a woman of color priority, but everyone's priority yes. to learn more about this data and research and help amplify women's voices, visit annenberg.usc.edu slash research to download, to download the information. Up next, we have producer and writer Gloria calderon Kellett in conversation with Gia Peppers, host of More Than That podcast. Ladies, take it away. Thank you. Thank you for that awesome intro. I am a so excited to be speaking to the incomparable human being, creative, television, just savant and legend, Gloria Calderon Kellett. Thank you so much for being here today. Your voice means so much. You're just, I know I'm not supposed to curse, so I won't say what I really want to say, but just how you show up <laughs> in this world is incredible. I was going to say something bad. Sorry, but I just wanted to start there. I'm so honored to have you. How are you doing? Like, how's your 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 day going so far? Great. I am very blessed. I cannot yes. complain about anything. So I I'm really having a wonderful day. It's beautiful, sunny here in my office in Los yes. Angeles, California. We're making, you know, we're getting to make important stuff. What we think is important stuff. So it's great. That is that is a a very modest way to describe what you do because the stuff that you make is 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 life affirming and I think all of the ways that you show up um, that open up our eyes to so many different experiences so I'm so ready to get into this conversation um, and so I'll yeah. ask the first question so the first okay. question is who shaped your path in your early career are there women who showed up for you in pivotal moments? that you would like to give flowers to, especially from those early, early days that really helped shape who you would become? Oh my God, so many women, so many women. So the first the first are my, grand, my grandmothers and my mother. Uh, mm. You know, I'm the daughter of Cuban immigrants. So I walk every day with the difficult decision that my grandparents had to make to uh, put their children on a plane, hoping that the strangers on the other side of the water would be kind. And I think about the strangers, whenever I do advocacy work here and when I do volunteer work here, 
I always think of that as that's me having the opportunity to pay back, be somebody else's stranger, because I will never be able to thank all the strangers that helped my parents come here uh, and, and start a life where they did not know any English and had to start completely from scratch and truly got to build the American dream, which is something that so many people are promised and not many people are able to uh, really make happen. And so I am the beneficiary of their hard work and their dedication and their love and their deep desire for their children to have freedom, which we get to have in this country. And, uh, and, and there's a lot to unpack with, with the, um, you know, it's so interesting to love a country like my parents do, because my parents are so like, there's a flag. They are so, they love America for what America is. <laughs> mm-hmm. And yeah. I'm one that's like, yes, yes, we can love it. But we can also call it out, right? We can Hello. call out, there's a lot that was not okay. There's a lot in our history books about black and brown and disenfranchised people that are not in the history books. And how can we as storytellers, mm-hmm. which is what I do, how can I rectify the situation? And so much of that rectifying is looking at history and calling out not only the stories I'm making now, but the stories that my children get to hear in school, the stories that are constantly, um, that so many children don't get to hear specifically ab- about, I think, black and brown and queer people and Asian people in this country. Mm-hmm. These are the people that built this country. These are the people that sweat and tears built this, built these properties and built these railroads and, and make our food and put the food on our tables today, right? That's right. So I I cannot help but constantly be thinking about all of those people who allow me to sit in my comfy office and write things and how I need to make something, need to make stories that serve Mm. them and that offer them hope. Mm. You're you're already preaching. We are one question in. Um, in the... (laughs) And the and the and the beautiful part about what you said, you said so many beautiful things, but where we connect our people, black and brown people, is the dismissiveness, the the ways that our stories have been dismissed. And I think we are living in such a beautiful time because thanks to streamers, thanks to places like Amazon, thanks to incredible yeah. people who are saying yes to our yes. our storytellers, people who get it, we are getting those stories told. I wanted to ask you in your opinion. Do you think we are living in a new re- renaissance? And if so, what's your take on how we make sure it's not a trend, but a thing that yes, say? not a moment but a movement. Yes, not a moment mm-hmm. but a movement. No, I think that it is being loud. I think that I am very inspired uh, by so many. You know, I'm around advocates all the time, advocates and storytellers, and I think the ones that are loud and are uh, relentless in knowing that the importance of having bodies like our bodies on screen, thriving, mm. experience joy, that that means something. That means something for children. Because when I was growing up, I loved TV. I was a latchkey kid. My parents worked. My grandparents would pick me up from school. And uh, I lived next door to my grandparents and I'd go into my house and they were at their house. And then my parents would come home. We'd have dinner at my grandparents' house. It was lovely. It was a lovely upbringing, mm. but I would watch TV. TV, 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 all the time. And never did I see people that look like my family on TV. Mm. Never. Mm. Uh, If I, I think the first time I did was Miami Vice and it was a Mm. character named Galdera and he was the drug dealer that they were afraid of. Right. So to know what the statistics are for my community, for, you know, it's America's demographic is, you know, 60% white, um, 18.5% 18.5% Latino, 13.4% Black. Like, th- mm-hmm. these are the, this is not what we see on our screens. And when we do see okay. it on our screens, I do feel like it is through a lens. I feel this as a woman as well. So often the stories we were hearing as I was growing up, the bodies that were uh, desirable did not mm. look like my curvy year old body, right? Did not mm-hmm. have a big old booty and, 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 and a mm-hmm. bodacious curves. Uh, and Come on, so curves. It makes, well, now I love it. Growing up, I was like, oh no, right. if I'm not this and I'm not, blo-, right? Like it tells you things, about, it tells you stories about yourself if you don't see any stories. And so we have to be part of the, of the telling of the stories. I think that women, the emerging of women telling stories on television shifted, 
right? And then people yeah. of color came in after, as we, you know, like this, I've really been here for the, for the shift of who is allowed to tell the stories. Mm -hmm. And what is so exciting mm -hmm. to me about being at a place like Amazon is that the stories that I care about, they care about. The story this year, Harlem was the show I watched. This year, Underground Railroad was the you know Underground Railroad, which gets this month, two pages in your history book, right? Hello? There's a whole series about it, right? Like th this is the type of storytelling that has been needed for mm -hmm. so long, and so to be at a place that that understands that and that is doing the work of that is meaningful to me. It is what made me choose to be at this place right now because I understood uh, that they that uh that they were going to want to hear the totality of my american latinidad experience and not have it just be trauma mothers weeping i mean i'm so i think the latino community is so tired of mothers weeping mm. and border crossings and that's it when you know 80 percent of us latinos are citizens 80 percent come on 67 percent were born here that's not not mm. according to my me. right so this is the, why it's so important it's so important that we get to we get to do this and we get to uh, really tell these stories. And I always focus on I have very strong female characters in my shows because, uh, again, I didn't get to see the strength of the women in, in my yeah. mother, my grandmother, uh, who deserve all the flowers in the whole wide world. Uh, and mm. now I get to do that by by breathing life into versions of them on screen. Uh, that just makes you are living the dream. You are the dream realized in so many ways. And it, it makes me so happy to hear your story because it mirrors so many of our stories living next door to your your grandparents or living close enough to where they were the people that watched you because your parents were were chilling and you watch TV and you escaped. And I think that's why we live in a space where so many creatives are thriving because we all lived in this like dream sequence at times just in front of the television screen, just sitting there, imagining what life could be, and then not seeing ourselves and noticing, hey, I think there's something wrong with this. And I think with the advent and the the, the ways that social media has mm. just been a new way for us to gather as a community or as various communities and call out what we don't like and actually see change happen because the gathering of voices were so loud that no mm. one, could even ignore it. I think social media also played a major role in this. Um, and I know you're, you are on Twitter all the time, so we're gonna get into the, the social media moments, but what do you think about how social media uh, aided or contributed to the movements of getting more of these stories told and supported? Well, I think you get direct, like, you know, when we were growing up watching TV, I mean, I'm older than you. So when I was growing up watching TV, I could never reach out to the creators of a show and say, thank you. I love this show. Here's what I love about this show. Here's what's meaningful to me about your show. I want to celebrate with you this show. There was no way to do that. Now there is, you could reach out to the actor. When I love something, I tweet at those actors. Oh, That's you right. did a beautiful job. I loved this show. I loved this performance. I love... And then they reply, right? Like <laughs> when, when that has that ever happened that we get to be participants yeah. in the, in the art and and speak yeah. to this is what was meaningful to me. This is what seeing this image meant so much to me. Mm. Here is why. And I think what's also I think really lovely about this work and where I get very moved is obviously I am making everything I do is is I'm trying to make up for this constant lack for this starvation of representation that I think women and people of color and LGBTQ people and on and on, so many disenfranchised groups that never get to see themselves, right? So I try to be an ally to, to those of which communities I'm not a part of as I have been lifted up by so many other people, right? So like this needs to be in community, this work. Uh, but it's mm. so moving to me when it's, hey, I'm not Latina, I'm, you know, I'm Korean, but my grandmother's just like this grandmother, or I'm a Jewish mm. lady from Brooklyn and this, this character no. is exactly, my cousin. Like, I love that mm. because it speaks to humanity. And if you're being really intentional and specific in your storytelling, it does latch on to that thing of we all love people in our lives. We all care about somebody. We're all worried about somebody. We're all right. Like that speaks to yeah. our human experience. And I think uh, being mm. able to latch on to that, speaking to a community and then 
also speaking to others as a result, there's no, it is such a blessing. I, I, I'm so uh, grateful that this is the, that this is the type of engagement. This is my advocacy. This is my preaching, right? This is where I'm doing, I'm Your doing pulpit. that work. This, this is my pulpit, the television, that square mm. box or rectangular box now is, is my pulpit. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, you are preaching the tithing. You know, we'll get some cash apps going to send the tithes. Uh, but no, <laughs> we think it's, uh, it's so important that 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 you know that community exists, and we can, like you said, share in it. You're right; like mm -hmm. that is the most beautiful part of it. We can say, "Hey, not only can we tweet the actors, we can tweet the studios. We can tweet the people yes. behind their marketing teams. We can tweet That's like right. y'all kill that rollout. More of this." more of that yes. Thank you. And then people actually can take it back to their you know presentations and be like at so and so on twitter said and it got three hundred thousand retweets and i think we need to just go ahead and do it like and that's i think right. that's so brilliant too the celebration is what i'm always trying to encourage my followers to do because it is mm. very easy to say i don't like this i don't like that i don't say what you love tell me what you love yeah. what meant a lot to you what was something that you saw it and it was amazing because that people, I think that we can engage in that in a, in a, it feels better to engage with that than, than the other. And I think that it can be so exhausting, the social media element, because it is often a place where people can have this keyboard courage to say anything Hello. that to sit in, what do you love? That's really what I try to focus on when I tweet. I try to say, here's what I love today. I saw this show and I loved mm. it, or I devoured it, or this performance, or this, you know, speaking on that and sharing that encourages others to also love up on stuff, or here's what I love, you know? So I, I think that's an important distinction. <laughs> I love this so much. And you actually have a public persona on Twitter as Tia Glow, uh, which I think I, is so beautiful, and where you sometimes have 30 minutes, fair conversations. Uh, whim moments, and you invite people to ask you anything about the industry, which I just think is so beautiful. So where did you get this inspiration to do that? And have you had any full circle moments while having your Tia Glow conversation? You know, I started because I, initially it was, I would have coffee with writers, right? Anybody who was mm -hmm. new to the town and they, they knew a friend or that I would sit down and have coffees with people. And then as I got busier, I wasn't able to do the coffees anymore. And okay. then I decided to do a, a Hollywood 101 series, which is for people who approached me to do a masterclass. And I was like, I don't want any information I have. I don't want anyone to have to pay for it. So if somebody okay. can work out a way that I can put it out there for free, because I don't think that this should be privileged information and so much the barrier to entry for so many people in my community is they can't afford something. So if yeah. something is free, I'm down. So mm -hmm. YouTube and, and Beto Like, BuzzFeed, they came together and they put together this uh, masterclass series that's on YouTube that's free. So then out yeah. of the masterclass, people started reaching out to me on Twitter with other questions. And I said, you know, here and there, I'm just going to host a little, hey guys, I'm here right now. What are you working on? How can I help? Mm. And then it just kind of turned it into, it took on a life of its own. <laughs> and, right. and it became a uh, it became a, a thing and it's, you know, I don't have time to do those copies anymore. I don't have time to read people's scripts and all those things I used to be able to do because it makes more time for, it makes more sense for me to focus on creating a show that's going to employ 200 people Hello. and going to do, going to see the eyes of millions of people, hopefully. Right. Mm. So that's really where I need to put my, most of my intention. But if I have a moment here or there, I do want to encourage people to reach out to me. And on Twitter, it's great because it lives there. So even if I can't get to it in that 30 minutes, I will get to it. I respond to everybody. I respond to everybody. Mm -hmm. And I and I just want them to know, I, storytellers, I want them to know that this is important work. It's more important than you even think, right? It really mm -hmm. is. Uh, yes, we get to tell stories and that's so fun and acting and all that's super fun. But to have been places now where people have seen the shows that I've made, and the way that they are always emotional about it. I've never seen a Latino family living in a beautiful house until I saw it with love. You know, I've never, I got emotional when I saw the kitchen and I saw the crosses in the kitchen and I saw the Virgin Mary clock. I started weeping because it looked like my grandmother's house and I've never seen that on TV before. Like, you know, yeah. that's the kind of stuff, the, the queer characters I've never seen. I mean, the with love is the first holiday rom-com to feature a trans love story ever. Glad has told wow. us that, that that it, so 
to, to be able to show love, to be able to show kindness, to be able to show uh, embracing of one another. And I get to do that in my work and I get to make people feel a little bit better about themselves when they're in their home. Mm. I mean, what a, what a great way to spend your life. <laughs> uh, right? It's right. Right. Like you get to do what you love with love, in love, love from love. Like you get it. You Come get on. it. Come on. What's better than that? So what is better than that? Truly. Okay. So speaking of ways to get better in the industry and, and all of the things that we hope to see and do, and we hope that storytellers feel like you also like I just feel I feel your heart from I'm on the East Coast today and I feel it over here. Uh, so I can tell that you really, really love what you do. But as we continue to discuss diversity and inclusion within the entertainment industry, what are some necessary steps you believe need to be implemented, implemented so we can see more real change? I know we've come far, but we still have yeah. a lot of work to do. So oh, from, from your lens, yeah what are some of those first I mean, steps I <laughs> yeah i think it's i think it's going pretty good but we could do a lot better a lot better yeah so i think um i really like to try to reach out to our allies and say mm -hmm. if you are a man that loves women if you are somebody who loves who does feel like i want the world to look i want the the conference rooms and the, and the executive suites to look more like what this country really looks like, then I want to empower those people to know that they can be our advocates. Their whiteness can be an advocate for somebody like me. They can. Hello. They can use it for good. That the work of equality is everyday work. Every day I am reminded that I'm a Latina woman living in America. Every day. Every day mm -hmm. you know you're a black woman walking in America, right? Yes, and is. so for someone else, who doesn't have to think about those things, mm -hmm. how can they, how can I say, I'd like you to think about me every day? I'd like mm -hmm. you to think about people from my community every day, because I'm trying to think of people from other communities every day. I'm watching okay. TV and 20% of this country is disabled. We do not have 20% disability on television. So even though I am not disabled or from that community, I can look for ways to bring that community into my work. How can I think of them? And I think if we start every day with the thought of how can I think of someone that is not me, like me? How can I help somebody mm. that's down here that needs a little bit of help in my work, in my life, in whatever, then we're gonna make, we're gonna create a better place for all of us. And there is yeah. still so much work in terms of, uh, in terms of equity that we need to really look at. And I think it gets very comfortable to be in your life and for it to be good and for it to be like, it's so hard, it's so tiring, it's so hard. Yeah, imagine how it feels for them. Imagine how it feels for right. us, imagine how, right? Think about how, I don't wanna talk about race and being a woman all the time. I really don't. Right. I wanna talk about the cooking show I saw last night. I wanna, right? We don't have a choice. <laughs> we, we have, have a to choice. talk about it Hello? Yeah. So we don't have a choice. So you wanna help? I need you to talk about it too. Mm. I need, when mm. I bring it up, I need you to listen. I need yeah. you to hold my hand. I need you to lift me up when I'm feeling tired. I need you to be a part of this daily journey. So I think the more we can really get into the executive suites and say, here's why you need to think about us more. All of us, right? Mm. There's a lot of us still not being represented. And America Ferreira said something so amazing on a panel the other day where she said, if you don't see yourself on television, it is like growing up in a house where none of your photos are on the walls. Woo! America is there. I it's mean. It's like, yes. I mean. How many people do not see their photos on the walls? And this is where they live. We mm. need to do a better job of making sure that all of our brothers and sisters and non-binary folk and all of that are seeing themselves, are aware that people care about them. It's all about the strangers on the other side of the water. It comes back to that for me for everything. How can I be somebody uh, stranger? How can I help them out and let them know I see you and I care about you and you are not alone in this mortal coil and you matter and your stories matter. And I think that then that, that equals more shows have to be greenlit for disenfranchised communities, more shows with women being powerful and not sexualized and not marginalized, more shows with, with black people, Asian people, Muslim people, like we need more. And what's great is now there's all these places 
So what I want that to mean is that there's going to be more, 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 joy, joy, joy. Mm. That's the way to mm. really do it. Walk the talk, but then you got to walk the walk. You got to walk the walk. Because I, I mean, I feel like I, I'm so curious to hear from you, but I feel like after last year, there was this sort of racial reckoning where um, Americans seemed to be very surprised that there was a lot of racism. And I was like, really? <laughs> you just found out? Okay, well, okay. welcome. Yep. Welcome. Yep. There is, um, but I worry that people were like, okay, well, I read the book. I read the book and I get it. Oh, it is awful. B back to my normal life. <laughs> and it's like, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. <laughs> hold on, whoa, whoa, hold on, whoa, whoa. Uh, There's more books. Yeah. There's more books. Oh There's goodness. more books every day. This can't just, this has to be an intention that all of us are walking the walk of making this world um, not so sexist, not so racist, not so, right? Like we all gotta be yeah. doing it daily. So that Absolutely. is really- Absolutely, I, I agree. I agree with you. I right? mean, I've seen so many companies tweet so many things over the past year, but especially in that summer about all that they were gonna do and how they were gonna show up. And I was talking to my friends who are, real activists like i believe you know in activating my activism where i am gifted and given the platform to do so but i have friends who are you know real life in the streets every single day on the front lines fighting and showing up and to hear some of them say 60 percent somewhat somewhere near there didn't give any money didn't really show up didn't do what they said they were going to do and still haven't two years later is just such a show to me that it was a lot of lip service and not a lot of action. And so to hear people who do take up space and who do demand people pay attention to the people who feel the most overlooked in this country from all walks of life in this world, it's just so inspiring to hear that you hold people, hold people's feet to the fire and say, hey, um, I do understand that, that, that you might not understand this experience, but this experience is human and deserves to be told in the same way that yours does with love, with integrity, with with truth. Um, and so to hear your 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 perspective has just really been so beautiful this whole entire conversation. I just have to say that. But yeah, I agree completely. Thank you. Thank you. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. Okay, we've run out of time. All right, I'm make, let me let me get back into journalist mode. Okay. Yes, yes. So your <laughs> your show with love centers so much love joy and heartwarming characters to our screen so how did you channel your personal joy into creating this powerful story that we get to love and celebrate oh my gosh well you know it really did come out of the pandemic it really came out yeah. of uh first of all that first christmas where it was like we're not going to see family this year we're going to be home mm -hmm. and I'm, i love a big family celebration i love gathering i love the kiki on the side telling the stories and who's doing what and <laughs> all of that fun wonderful loud food all of it and at the same time my instagram really was a barrage of uh violence towards black and brown and asian and queer bodies it was a daily yeah. here the hate crimes have gone up against the asian community because of coronavirus here's so it was such a you know like i, I don't get to see people i don't get to talk about what I'm seeing on this phone that is yep. so hard for my heart again and again and again. And, and then when I go see my mother who lives across the street, cause I'm hardcore Latina, um, <laughs> I see my mom and she is watching all these home Hallmark movies and all of mm. these like elf she's watching out oh, so good. All these great, I love it. It's a wonderful life. I love it. It's a wonderful life. I love it. Yes. Man, one of my favorite movies of all time. Those are white yeah. Christmases though. Right. So it's like, I would like to see, People like me, people like you, people like yeah. the people in my circle falling in love yeah. at Christmas time. That's really how it started. And then I thought, oh, well, if I'm gonna do Christmas, I gotta do New Year's. Oh, if I'm gonna do New Year's, I gotta do Valentine's Day. And then it just became, oh, maybe this is a series. <laughs> and so when I, when I pitched it to Amazon, I said, you know, I think we get to follow this family over the course of a year and we get to see them. Mm. We pick up with them on these very heightened days, which holidays are heightened days as I was filling it out, as I was filling out the, who, who, who are these people? Um, I thought about the people that I spend a lot of time with the people in my family, my really, I'm very close with my brother. Uh, and so having a brother, sister at the center of it was really important. I wanted to speak to, I have more than one queer member of my family. 
So it right. feels like there's only allowed to be one queer person in every show. And I was like, what if we have more right. than one queer person in the family? That's my, my family has more than one queer person. Let's do that. Um, yeah. And then, and, and it just kind of, and then Afro Latinidad is very rarely seen on TV. It's not, you know, I think uh, there are so many Afro Latinos that, and, and it's interesting because our actors, Rome Flynn and Andre Droyo, they both never played Latino. They've never gotten to play Latino before. Wow. And they're Afro Cuban wow. men that are brilliant, right? So not being able to play the totality of your experience ever and how meaningful it was uh, for them to be able to do so, because that's a huge part of our community that is often overlooked. So all of those things, we just got to put it in. And then there were little intentional things I got to do. Uh, you know, Latinos are, are the biggest uh, owners of small businesses right now. So to mm. be able to have them all be small business owners. So the, the Diaz family owns a family restaurant. The Zayas men own a construction company and bespoke furniture business. You know, it was like important that those little elements were there too. This is what generational yeah. wealth can look like. Many people from our community don't get to see that. This is what it looks like. Yeah. This is third generation, working hard, building, growing, investing. This is how it can look. This mm. can be the aspiration. So all of that came into play when I, when I was putting it together and it was very, you know, intentional. Uh, how can I service the people that I love? And this show is really a love letter to them. Oh, and, and it is beautiful. It is a beautiful love letter that we all can relate to. And fortunately we are wrapping, but I do want to ask you because so many young women and especially young women of color want to tell stories, but they feel like it's oversaturated. People are already telling the stories. They have no idea where to start. They're overwhelmed with the process. So if you could give them a piece of advice as to why they should try anyway, what would you tell them and why? Where would you tell them to start? Oh my gosh, please start. We need all of these voices. We need all of these voices. Please start. Start at your library. You know, when we didn't have a lot of money, the library was the place I would go. And you can get books on writing. You can get books on directing. Sydney Lamette's book is amazing. Robert McGee's book on story, Bird by Bird by Annie Lamott. Like mm. there's so many books that you can get for free at your, at your local library and start there and just really start to form a love of storytelling and know that your story, if you, especially if you do not see yourself on television, know that you making that will mean that someone else will get to see it. If you can't see it, be it so someone else can see it because that is what is gonna change somebody else's world, not only yours. So your story is valuable and whoever you are that's watching, you gotta tell it. Tell the story. Thank you so much, Gloria Calderon. Kellett, you are all the things that are right with the entertainment industry. And I think we'll see so much more from you. I could ask you a million more questions. We have officially run out of time. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. And thank I you love for lifting us up. I love sharing space with you today. And now back to you in the studio. Oh, gosh. Gloria was dropping gems. I'm always so energized by women who are planted firmly in their power and unafraid to call out spaces that are unwelcoming to those who have been othered. The path that she is laying for emerging storytellers of all backgrounds in front of and behind the camera is deeply intentional and rooted in a mission of inclusion. Oh, I love the quote she shared from America Ferreira. If you don't see yourself on television, it's like growing up in a house where none of your photos are on the wall. Who wants to live in a house like that? Representation matters. Visibility matters. And it's not just to tick boxes, okay? We're done with that. It's to show the next generation that they matter. Oh, thank you so much, Gloria, for your transparency and vulnerability. What a powerful conversation. When she said that thing about white people whiting, okay, that resonated. Now, in our next panel, Tatiana Siegel, senior writer at Rolling Stone, speaks with Emmy-nominated casting director Angelique Midthunder and the Ardios Awards nominee casting director Carla Hool to explore the journey of a script through talent. Tatiana, over to you. Thank you from the studio. 
Hello, and welcome to Voices, Women Innovating Hollywood. I'm Tatiana Siegel, senior writer at Rolling Stone and former executive film editor at The Hollywood Reporter. Today's panel is leading in a women-dominant field, casting directors. And we have two amazing casting directors here with us who specialize in underrepresented talent and placing women of color in films, TV, and streaming series. We've got Emmy nominee, Angelique Midthunder, and RTO's award nominee, Carla Houle. Angelique, let's start by telling me a little bit about yourself and some of your career highlights. A career highlights, definitely right now I'm working on a television series called Reservation Dogs, which is um, the, both of the showrunners are indigenous, all of the writers, the cast, all of the directors are Native American. Um, so it's, and, and the cast just last weekend won uh, Best Ensemble Cast at the Independent Spirit Awards. Oh, um, congratulations. And, Thank you. Yeah, an entirely Native American cast to win that. Um, definitely, definitely a career highlight. So I'm kind of riding the high of that wave right now. Nice. Uh, and Carla, let's hear a little bit about your background as well. Yeah, well, I'm from Mexico. Uh, I started my career in Mexico and moved uh, 15 years ago to LA. And since I moved here, I've been basically casting uh, Latinx shows and uh, fighting for Latino representation in the industry in Hollywood. Um, and highlights, uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, I think Coco was one of those where it was great to see a movie about Mexico be so, so successful and done with such authenticity. Um, and, you know, Pixar usually never hires anyone outside of the, you know, they have in-house casting. So it was like the first time they went out because they wanted such authenticity and the movie was such su success that I, I, you know, I think that th that is one of the highlights and maybe um, Narcos is another one of, of the shows that I'm really, really proud of because I was able to introduce a lot of Lat Latino actors that, uh, were not big name actors, uh, they were known and uh, give them open, open, opening doors for them and give them those opportunities. They, you know, it was, it was kind of um, a great project to be, you know, to work on. So yeah, more or less that. I'm curious if either of you had any mentors when you were starting out. My dad, but he's a, he's a producer. You know, he was, he was, he's the one who kind of uh, gave me advice always about the industry. And, and he still gives me advice. Sometimes I'm, you know, with so much work and so stressed, as you know, Angelique, and sometimes, you know, the deadlines, everything that can get really stressful. He's always like, remember, it's just a movie. It's not the end of the world. <laughs> so it's till, till today, he's always, you know, there to, to advise me. Um, for mentors, I mean, uh, Joanna Bolton was a casting director that I started working as her assistant and worked my way up through her office. And when I went out on my own, she would, you know, pass projects along to me. I also have always been a member of um, Women in Film, uh, CSA. So I've had a lot of, you know, there's a lot of community available to us as well. So um yeah, I think I've I've been surrounded by good, uh, you know, kind of a community of mentors, if you will. What would a fully inclusive Hollywood landscape look like to either of you? Having, you know, diversity in every single department, right? Uh, including ours, casting, uh, having diversity in the writing room, producers, directors, casting directors, just in, you know, I think, and I think like like what uh, Angelique was saying about her her show, which is amazing. You know that that everyone was Native American. When do you really see that? You know, it's like, and it's like so hard. You know, I've I've had so very few shows where everyone is actually la Latino. It's it's um, it's wonderful to be a part of something like that, but it's so new because it doesn't happen a lot. That's what I think. I don't know. You and Jalik. 
Yeah, I totally agree with that. Like she said, the writers' rooms, the producing teams, um, having diversity in all of those departments, um, ethnic diversity, but also to see more women in those positions above the line and um, and in front of the camera too. You know, um, I love to see a Latinx person or an Asian person, a Native American person playing a role that isn't scripted as such. Um, you know, and it can just be a person and then it happens to be a person of color. Um, those are the types of stories that I think then they become more interesting because the people have, you know, kind of just organically with them a story behind them or a history as to what got them there that kind of creates a story, story building and that enriches storytelling, I think. What have been some of the challenges around casting intersectionality underrepresented groups, such as indigenous talent within the Latino community, or for example, disabled talent from historically excluded racial ethnic groups? Well, I think one of the challenges might be that there just aren't a lot of opportunities um, on paper, you know, for for everyone that that maybe there these aren't always people that are in the forefront of the minds of the creators of the shows. So I think that's when, you know, someone like Carla or myself, we come across somebody who is unique in their own way, whether it be, you know, that they are disabled um, or that they are from an underrepresented community that isn't in the forefront of your mind. That So I imagine you do the same thing that I do and you come across somebody that's interesting like that and talented, you kind of, you know, pin them in your mind for like, let's keep an eye out for places where we can put these people in um, that that are different or unique, but would bring something really special to a role. Yeah, and also like kind of push, you know, there are projects where our voice counts a lot more, you know, some, sometimes they hear, hear us out a lot more, sometimes a little bit less. I always try to speak my mind um, so like when I, for example, a show I'm casting, like I'm looking at the, at the leads they're going for and they're all Latin, Latinx, but more towards the white side. And I'm like, why don't we should have diversity because Latinx is the thing with Latinx. It's, it's such a, it's such a complex world because it's very diverse within itself. It's very diverse. You have all sorts of Latinx people. You have Asian Latinx Black Latinx, uh, blonde, blue-eyed Latinx. You know, you have like Latinos that the, from all ethnic groups. So I try to be like, you should show more diversity within the Latino community. Um, so I think it's it's also a little bit on us uh, trying to fight, you know, and speak our minds and just fight for for those those actors for that diversity. What would you say is the single biggest challenge you are facing in your career right now? I would probably say still get out of that box. Um, because the way, and, and also, I mean, me personally, as a casting director, get out of a box because I don't, I, 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 I don't understand why we need to be in a box. Um, I think Angelique can cast any ethnicity, any kind of, you know, uh, role, not just Native American, same, you know, with me, that and also to fight for the actors that also just are just put in a box of only only um, playing Latino roles. Yeah just educating uh you know filmmakers about uh the like carla was saying the same thing about the diversity in the indigenous community um, and what it means to be indigenous from the different regions and um, the mixing that goes on and the tribal affiliations there's just there's a lot to learn um, you know I'm still learning but you know just to um, kind of create uh, more education and awareness for for um, breaking outside of the stereotypes, like Carla said, of what um, a Latinx or a Native American 
you know, person looks like, because there is also um, a lot of diversity, like same thing what Carla said, inside of the communities, there's still a lot of diversity. You both work with up and coming talent, I assume. Um, do you tend to, um, you know, uh, try and help these people who are coming up, you know, have a way of fitting in with, with this sort of system that it might not always be kind to uh, people coming up, people of color, that kind of thing. Um, well, I would say I work a lot with international actors and um, my advice to them because, um, you know, what is really hard coming to, coming to Hollywood is accents. So one of the advices I usually give them is is to get rid of the accent so they can play, you know, any kind of role and not get boxed in. You know, you've you've heard stories of actors like like Oscar Isaac was do what's the saying the other day on um, SNL, right? That he his real name is Oscar Isaac Hernandez is uh, something else. I don't remember exactly what it was, Estrada or something something else, and that um, Hollywood ended up choosing Oscar Isaac, the two white names, right? Um, <laughs> So in a way, and, and because of that, he can play anything because he's not put into that box. So what I try to uh, tell actors is try to uh, prepare yourself in a way that you can play anything so that you're not put in a box. And then it's really hard to get out of that box. How about you, Angelique? What kind of advice do you give to uh, young actors and actresses you're working with? Um, I mean, just to work hard, you know, um that they have to work just as hard or harder to be seen and heard. Um, so, you know, especially coming from, it's kind of different vibe coming from the, the, the indigenous communities and there aren't as many opportunities. So when you do get an opportunity to grab it, to work hard, not to let it go and, and to really take advantage of the opportunities that are in front of you. In your work as casting directors, how often do each of you battle with your personal ethics and mission against Hollywood's sort of practices, uh, the modus operandi here, when informing others how to succeed in the industry? You know, we have um, an issue in uh, casting Native American roles where um, there are actors who say that they are Native American when they may not be authentically a part of a Native American um, nation or community. Just like an actor will say they can ride a horse or a motorcycle or do a sport or whatever. Uh, this is also something that comes up and that's tough for me. I don't want to be the identity police. I want to trust you. If you say that you are something, I want to trust that. But there are, you know, there are um, actors or there are circumstances where um, before kind of all of this awareness existed, there were actors kind of getting their foot in the door that way, um, which bothers me because I feel like not only are you misrepresenting someone on screen, you're taking away an opportunity from someone who is actually Native American, which is already such an overlooked population. And then you're also taking away the opportunity for people from the Native American communities to see themselves represented authentically on screen. And what does that do to your, you know, uh, sense of self-worth, right? And then looking forward, um... How can we open the door for the next generation of women and women of color to come into this industry and excel? What would be sort of your final thoughts on that? I mean, for me, it's just within my own office. I have, you know, my associates and, and people that I work with that I try to teach them everything that I know, uh, just, you know, copy them on a 
produce on emails with producers and and you know studios and networks and just i try to be completely transparent with my staff so that they and give them access to everything that i have access to so that you know i'm the oldest one in the casting office and so you know uh, you know as i'm on my way out i have a handful of ladies that um of young women and ladies that i hope will um you know excel after me and that have you know the opportunity to learn and grow in the field hmm. um what i do is for example csa organized this this um women of color um mentorship program um so i participated there because i struggle i i, I actually find it that there are very few uh latin x casting directors very few so i actually it's hard for me to find associates and assist assistants that are latinx in order to you know help help with diversity in my own area i don't know you angelic but i'm sure native american well you're i'm sure you know diversity in general it's in within the casting uh community is 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 something we need to start I think that's that's where things need to start with. Um, if there are more diverse casting directors, they're also going to fight for diversity. I think we need to start there. You know, having more diverse casting directors so that um, we all strive to cast diverse act, um, actors. Um, and I think CSA is 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 moving on doing organizing things to help there. Um, but personally, just mentoring people and uh, trying to hire people that are diverse. Yeah, and then we'll see that lead to on the screen. Um, you exactly. Know, it's, it's a definite exactly. natural progression. It's like, you know, many times they ask us, what, what can you do? Because you already get the script with the characters and the ethnicities of the characters. And, and so where does diversity start, right? Well, it starts in the writing room. So if in the writing room, you don't have writers that are going to write diverse characters, you know, so in every department, there's got to be that diversity so that it can show in the final product. That's, that's what I think. And that includes us as casting directors as well. All right, that's all we have time for. This has been an amazing conversation. I learned a lot and I hope everyone watching also did. And Angelique, and Carla, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you. Thank you, pleasure. Tatiana. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Angelique. Thank you, Tatiana. All right, and back to the studio. Yes, yes. First off, congratulations to Angelique on the Independent Spirit Award nomination. What a milestone in the history books for an entirely Native American cast, seeing both Angelique and Carla's work in action is a reminder that not only are they creating space for the underrepresented talent to thrive, but they are also slowly dismantling a system that once suppressed their voices in their stories. To be in a position where you can help others while also teaching an industry to unlearn its traditional ways is powerful, purpose-driven work. That could also be the title for today, because I have to say, my spirit is full. Everyone we heard from was vulnerable, authentic, insightful, and passionate about the work that they're doing. We're also so grateful to have shared space with all of them this afternoon. I hope each of you watching takes time to reflect on how you can do your part to continue advancing, advancing this industry that we love. It takes all of us to be the change we want to see. Voices came to you today from the land of the Gabrielino, Tongva, and Chumash people. Now, before we close, we're going to take it up a notch with our girl Lizzo. She shares some great thoughts on her personal self-love, the power of presence, and remember that you are, yes, you know what I'm talking about. We're going to see a sneak peek of her and the big girls, which drops today 
on Prime Video. Make sure you check it out. One time for the big girls, two times for the big girls. <laughs> Thank you all for watching. And we see you on the Prime Live video. We see you all talking and we know that you're excited. Thank you so much. Big girls have always had value, but I don't think society has seen the value in bigger bodies. I can lead an example for a younger person who's, you know, watching me on social media and they're like, it's okay to be sad, it's okay to cry, it's okay to have emotions, it's okay to be angry about something, and it's also okay to be radically positive and practice radical self-care. I always used to live in the future or I would dwell in the past, like I would sit and I'd be like, I can't believe I did that. Or, be like, what's next, what's next? And I think that I've just been so present lately because I don't want this moment to pass me by. I wanna soak it up and I wanna appreciate it and you and all of you and just say thank you so much for spending this time with me right here, right now. Just remember that you are. Remember that you are, you are it. You are whatever you say you are and you're whatever you believe. You're not what these people say you are. You're not what society says you are. You are what the you say you are, so look in that mother mirror and remind yourself of who you are because you are that. You know, I'm proud to rep Houston, but I'm not proud to rep Texan politics right now. And there are very regressive laws being passed. They are taking away the right for young children to have a, a chance to live authentically as themselves. And it's, it's a violation of human rights. Trans rights are human rights. We got a lot of other things y'all need to be handling instead of y'all being in people's homes, telling them what to do with their body and being all up in their uterus. Get your mother <laughs> Mind your business. Because the abortion ban is yes. atrocious as well. Mind your business. Stay out of my body. This is not political. This is not political. I'm here as the executive producer and star of my own television show, Lizzo's Watch Out for the Big Girls on Prime Mother Video. <laughs> Woo! It feel good to be a big right now. I love being a fat. She relaxes me. I want you to take a good look at it. But enough about me. I want to introduce the true stars of this show. Are you guys ready? Make some big noise for the beautiful big girls of Watch Out for the Big Girl! Watch out for the big girl. 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 Big girl. Watch out for the 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 big girl. Big girl. Big big girl. Big girl, 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 big girl
With you by my side, with you by my side
Fly with the stars, I'm free. Party all day, every weekend. Make it boom, boom to the beat. Make it boom, 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 boom. Fly with the stars, I'm free. Party all day, every weekend. Cause I don't wanna waste my time, no I'm young and dumb and old plays right But I'm bound to turn out alright, yeah This city's really not my vibe now So I'm moving out my parents' house, yeah To go and live another life Where my dreams don't lay down and die I'll hang out with the folks on screen I'll be chilling in a pot of gold You should bet your money on me Cause I'm never Sometimes, yeah. but I'm not picking up tonight Cause I'm a bit too busy Serving all the smiles Having me a real good time With a drink full of bottles It's the back for my hell Holy shit, I just stumbled Still I'm feeling myself I fly with the stars on free Party all day, every week
know how to live Cause I didn't love myself Wish I could turn back time Go back and do things right Give you a wedding ring Give you my everything And be there by your side Share a life and have a child There's no 